Hi, I'm Allison Powell. I've been an AP teacher for about 12 years and taught five different AP subjects. Tonight, I'm going to teach you a little bit about government, uh, most specifically the legislative and judicial branches. So I hope you um, can participate because that will help you learn the material a little bit better. You want to introduce yourself in the chat box that would be great Hi, Hugh. Okay, again, we're going to be talking about the legislative and judicial branches. Um, if in the chat box you can see me and see the screen, see both me and the um, slides, let me know. Great. Okay. So if you'll add us on Twitter and uh, Instagram, we're at think 5 -able. If you'll subscribe on YouTube, we've got lots of great content to share with you on those platforms. The first thing I want you to do is tell me how familiar you are with these terms. So take a minute to look at them. These are the things that we're going to be talking about today. If it's been a long time since you've been in AP Gov, like last semester, and you haven't really thought about it since December, you know, you might be at a one and that's okay. But if you feel like that you could explain it to a friend, that would be a five level. So if in the chat box, you can tell me where you think you are. All right, that's okay. Um, I know it was really difficult for my students because Gov was a semester class and so they wouldn't have uh, like information or regular information about these terms for five months before they took the exam. And that was just not good. So they had to study on their own. Again, Bible Bowl would be a great place uh, for them to learn or to re-familiarize themselves with it. All right, so Dakota says that he just started the class. Uh, and so you haven't really dug deep into these yet, I'd say, and someone else is trying to get ahead for next year. Well, that's great. Good to have you. So uh, I want to talk a bit about the framers intent here. So how do we know that the framers really thought that Congress would be the most powerful branch? Does anybody know why the framers or how do we know that the framers thought that Congress would be the most powerful branch? Yeah, good. So Dakota tells us uh, that Article One is the longest. Yeah, and it's Article One. So it's the very beginning of the Constitution. They set up uh, the legislative branch, the U.S. Congress. But here's what's interesting. Even though they thought that Congress would be the most powerful branch, they still wanted it to be a slow and deliberative body. So how do I know that they wanted the process to be slow? So what in the Constitution slowed down the process of making laws? So what's how they set up the structure of the Congress, how did that aid in slowing down the process of making laws? Okay. Have you heard good checks and balances? Good, they, they put a lot of checks and balances and that definitely slows things down. But 
what there are two parts of Congress. What are the two parts of Congress? Like there's two kind of like sub branches to Congress. Good, the House and the Senate. So we call that a bicameral legislature. And that slows down the process because things have to pass in the House and then they have to pass in the Senate. And then they have to, the law has, or the act has to be, the bill has to be reconciled. Um, it has to be the same before it can become law after it's um, signed by the president. Okay. So we'll talk more again about Congress's powers, how it's set up, and the process of how a bill becomes a law. So the enumerated powers of Congress are the expressed or delegated powers. You'll see those words interchangeable on the AP exam. So if you see enumerated, expressed, or delegated, they all mean the same thing. Those are the powers that were written down in Article 1. And if you look there at the list, most of those have to do with money, uh, the power to tax and spend. They can borrow money. They can coin money. They can uh, allow someone else, another body, to regulate the money supply. They issue copyrights and patents, which deals with uh, entrepreneurs being able to make money. Um, and the big one there is number three, that they can regulate commerce. So this is called interstate commerce, commerce between states uh, and with foreign nations as well. They have the power to do that. So almost anything that we see uh, Congress making a law about, how they're able to do that is through the enumerated power of interstate commerce. I um, also wanted to note here that they create lower courts, except for the Supreme Court. There's no other court that is put in the Constitution besides the Supreme Court. They allowed, the framers allowed for Congress to create the lower courts. I also wanted to highlight the fact that Congress is the branch that can declare war. Okay. So there are enumerated powers implied powers and inherent powers and if you see like the little meme that i showed you there a lot of kids um or students they have a dif like difficulty understanding what an implied power is so if, if i imply something i am um kind of hinting around at something or i'm basing it off of something else so here are the implied powers are powers uh, by the way, we get this from the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution. We also called this the elastic clause. So it says that Congress can make all any laws that are necessary and proper in order to fulfill the enumerated powers. So the implied powers are based on the enumerated powers. So, for example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said that private businesses could not discriminate on the basis of race and and other things okay they did so because through the elastic clause and uh, the interstate commerce clause uh, because at the time people minorities were having a difficult time traveling uh, between states because they didn't know if they would have a place to eat or a place uh, to take shelter uh, because not all hotels and not all uh, eating establish establishments were desegregated. And so the Civil Rights Act put a stop to that. But there's nowhere listed in the, the Constitution that, they, that Congress had the ability, that exact ability but they do have the ability to regulate interstate commerce. So this is kind of implied. Okay, I've got a question. Okay. Yeah, very good. So an implied power would be that um, what the money is going to look like, but not, it doesn't say that in the Constitution, but it does say that they can coin money. Okay, good. Very good, Dakota. All right, so inherent powers are different. Um, they're kind of more similar, though, to implied powers than the enumerated powers. 
Here, it's not expressed, it's not even really implied in the Constitution, but it's just inherent in being a government. So you'll also talk about inherent rights. So if you're born, you are, you have some God-given rights is kind of the term. So you have some rights just that you inherited basically as being a citizen. So these are uh, powers that Congress has just because they are a government. So governments are supposed to be able to put down rebellions and secure borders. It's not in the Constitution. It's not even implied in the Constitution. It's just they must do that to be an effective government. Okay. So Article 1 also puts forth some things that Congress can't do. So they can't pass, pass ex post facto laws. They can't say, okay, we're going to make a, uh, a law that criminalizes owning uh, pets over 50 pounds and everybody who has previously had a pet over 50 pounds, well, you're going to jail. Um, they can't do anything like that. One, that's crazy and people would be up in arms. But two, um, they can't criminalize past acts okay um they also can't pass a bill of attainder which basically what that would do is congress would declare you uh you um guilty of some act who is in charge of declaring guilt or trying people is it the congress oh unless you're the president <laughs> or uh a a lifetime appointed judicial member. Good. Okay, so the courts do that. The courts can declare uh, guilt. The Congress can't. And a bill of attainder is basically uh, a law that Congress would pass saying that someone was guilty of some act. Okay. They cannot suspend habeas corpus unless uh, there's like a rebellion. Okay. And President Lincoln actually uh, did suspend habeas corpus back during the Civil War. But habeas corpus in Latin actually says you have the body. So what that means is the government can't just come and arrest you uh, without telling you what you're charged with. So you would... Um, write up a writ of habeas corpus and what that would say is hey you have the body please tell me why you are holding this person uh, in order to continue holding them so that's why i have the handcuffs there because if um they want to hold you they have to tell you why it basically here in this section we have some ideas about having a fair trial okay so we can't grant titles of nobility here in the good old U.S. of A. So can't make barons. Um, and members of Congress and all government officials, including the president, are not supposed to receive emoluments. Okay. Um, I'll answer that in just a second, Dakota. But first, I want to pose to y'all, uh, do you guys know what emoluments are? And it's kind of uh, been in the news recently or with the election of Donald Trump, what an emolument is. You, while you're thinking about that, let me answer Dakota's uh, question. Okay, so Miranda rights are based on this idea that we should have fair trials um, and that you are informed when you're being arrested. That also deals with the Fourth Amendment as well. And so in later uh, review sessions, we'll talk about that Fourth Amendment. Okay. Well, emol emoluments are gifts. And so no public official is basically able to profit or they're not supposed to be able to profit off of their uh, government position. So this was a big deal when Trump became elected because he has a whole lot of um, investments such as hotels where it could be seen as a gift 
if people who want his political favor go stay at his hotel, like like a gift, like that is seen, could it be seen as a gift? Uh, and so there was quite a bit of controversy when he uh, was elected about whether or not he was receiving emoluments. Okay, so I wanna walk us through two or three AP questions here. All right, and I'm gonna give you about two minutes to read these and see what you think, and then we'll kind of go over it. And if you'll put in the chat box what you think it is for number one and number two, that'd be great. Uh, this is a safe space. There's only a couple of us here, so you know, don't feel bad about getting it wrong. I misread one one time in a hug chat and and got it wrong myself. So So for number one, the legislative process at the national level of government reflects the intent of the framers of the Constitution to create a legislature that would be, okay, A, less powerful than the executive. That's not correct because we talked about how um, they thought that the Congress, the legislative branch, would be more powerful than the executive, okay? Um, so now I want to go to D, ensure that all citizens are equally represented. It does talk about equality under the law uh, in the Constitution, sort of, um, except not everyone was actually represented equally at the time, uh, being that slaves uh, did not count as a person and were not complete citizens. Um, and women didn't have voting rights, that sort of thing. But it's talking about the how they wanted to create legislature. OK, so C, involve as many citizens as possible in the legislative process. Right. You got that right, Greg or Q. So um, that's not true either, because they didn't allow women to vote. Uh, People who didn't have property couldn't vote in the very beginning. Um, so B is the correct answer, a slow and deliberate uh, lawmaking process. They wanted uh, it to be broken up in between a House and a Senate, and they both had to pass the same version of the bill. Yeah. All right. Um, so, and actually, I think it was three-fifths. Anyhow. All right, on number two, um, I think I could have probably gone over number two a little bit more. All right, let's see what we got on two. All right, yeah. All right, so A is the correct answer here. So if The government, it authorized the government to deny income tax deductions for employer health plans that did not offer employees the option of keeping health insurance after leaving the job. That's called COBRA. Um, they were able to make this law just like they were able to make many others through the Commerce Clause, okay? A, uh, regulating commerce among the states. Who can declare, B, who can declare laws unconstitutional? Who has that power?
Good. So, yeah, you both got it right. So the Supreme Court can do that. Borrowing money on the credit of the United States. Now, they can do that. Congress has that ability. But that's not really related to making uh, businesses or creating healthcare legislation, basically. Issue copying patents, copyrights and patents. They can do that. It's just that's not related to this uh scenario about health insurance regulations okay now this one number three we did not talk about um but i still we, we haven't talked about both sides of this we kind of talked about the necessary and proper clause that it's also called the elastic clause and that gives congress like implied powers to enact the enumerated uh powers we talked about the Commerce Clause and about how that's probably the most important uh, power that Congress has. So that way they can regulate business activity because almost everything deals with business. We did not talk about the fact that the national government has supremacy over local and state governments. And we haven't talked about the Fifth Amendment yet. OK, uh, but that limits that does not enhance federal power of the Fifth Amendment. All the amendments, or most of the amendments, are going to restrict constitutional provisions. Good. So uh, Dakota says B. Yeah, that's it. Because the Tenth Amendment does enhance state power. Okay. For the Fourteenth Amendment limits state power. Uh, the Tenth Amendment there is basically that the states have other uh, rights or other ability to make laws. Okay, that's what the 10th Amendment is all about. So good deal. All right, so this is a question on the last released practice exam that's on the AP site. And for all your AP exams, I would definitely look through the FRQs that they have posted as well as the multiple choice uh, exams that they have posted as well. They usually have at least one. So I want you to look at this and I want, I've got on the next slide what they actually took as an answer. And I think it will surprise you. So uh, before I give you the answers though, I want us to try to figure out uh, the answer. So consumers complained after EpiPen maker Mylan hiked the price of emergency auto injector by $100 in recent months for no obvious reason. The price has increased 450% since 2004 when a dose cost $100 in today's dollars to the current price of more than $600. The medication isn't expensive. Analysts calculate that the dosage contained in a single pen is worth about a dollar. Okay. And I've taught econ for quite some time. And the reason why they can do that is because, well, and you guys probably know this, if, if you need an EpiPen, you're gonna pay a bunch for it. You're willing to pay a bunch for it because you need it to live, you know, if you have a, um, an allergic reaction. Okay, so describe a power of Congress that Congress could use to address the comments outlined in the scenario. So what can Congress do? What is their main function? How can they address this problem? What would you say? And this doesn't have to be a fancy answer. Good. They can make a law saying that it could only uh, be a certain price because they can regulate commerce. Good. Uh, yeah, so he said, well, 
can they do this? Yeah, they can do this uh, because of the Commerce Clause. They can regulate prices. And in fact, they have regulated prices on some things in the past, uh, especially uh, necessary products. Okay. Uh, so let's look at what the AP exam uh, readers took. So here are three uh, answers. Number one, Congress could pass a bill prohibiting imp important life or death medications from being marked up above a certain value. By doing this, Mylan would be forced to lower their prices to a more reasonable value. Okay. All right, so um, do you think that that got the point? And again, the question is describe a power. So by the way, on the AP exam, describe, you don't have to talk as much as you do when you have to explain something. So if it's, you see describe, uh, you need to probably give more than one sentence if you can. However, it does not have to be too lengthy. Okay, and Dakota, I'll answer your question in a minute. So first though, do you think that that got the point? Yes or no? Good, yeah, it did get the point. All right, so number two, the second one, an oversight power Congress could use to take action on the company's on the complaints above would be making it illegal to charge that much for medication when the medication itself was extremely cheap, especially since EpiPens are used in life and death emergencies. So before we read the next paragraph, I want to say that this, if, if it didn't have the second paragraph, this would not have gotten credit because they say it's an oversight power. And then they said to make it illegal. And oversight power really is about Congress's ability to oversee the bureaucracy, to like uh, issue subpoenas and have hearings uh, to make sure that bureaucratic agencies are, are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, oversight power and uh, making a law are kind of two different things. And they never say anything about making a law in the first paragraph, okay? All right, the second paragraph says, if Congress does write a bill to try to pass a law prohibiting making the medication so expensive, then the president must approve or veto the bill. Okay, so this was the second part of the essay, which was supposed to be about what can the president do Okay, to try to influence this. So this person actually got the point because in the second paragraph, they said something about passing a law. Okay, so Congress has the authority to pass laws about uh, all kinds of things, including uh, regulating commerce. Okay, the third uh, sample response, Congress can pass a law setting a price limit of medications on EpiPens. Do you think that that got the point? Yeah, you would think it <laughs> would not, right? Because I would, I expected you to say no, but it actually got the point. They, all they wanted you to say was something about Congress setting, uh, passing a law. That is all that was required. Now, it would be great if you guys said something like, um, I think Dakota said about because they can regulate commerce. I think that would be way better. However, you didn't have to. You just had to say Congress has the ability to pass laws and they can pass a law about it. Now, that's the only point that that student got on the essay. The other uh, two points they did not get. But I don't want to go over that because it's not really about Congress. It was about the president. Okay, but before I go on to this, you can look here at uh, this table while I answer Dakota's question about the Eighth Amendment.
So here, um, this table discusses the difference between the House and the Senate. First, in just demographics, um, the House requirements are more lenient. You only have to be 25 instead of 30 with the Senate, only a seven-year citizen instead of a nine-year citizen. Uh, the term is only two years in the House, whereas in the Senate, it is a six-year term. A house member has to reside in the district uh, where they're campaigning from, okay? Whereas the Senate, Senate seats are statewide, so they just have to reside somewhere within the state. Every state has two senators, and every state has to have at least one house member. So those really very lowly populated states, like in the West, um, they only have uh, three total members, one House member and two Senate members. But the whole House of Representatives has 435 seats. Okay. The specific powers to the House is that they can originate tax, they must originate tax bills. Um, and they can they can impeach the president as well as impeach like judicial um, justices. Okay. They also get to choose the president if the electoral college fails. So if no one gets 270 votes, no president gets 270 votes, then they get to choose the president. Whereas on the Senate side, they ratify treaties, they conduct the trial of impeachment. They choose the vice president if the electoral college fails, and they get to advise the president on presidential appointments. So both uh, judicial branch appointments as well as his um, the heads of his bureau bureaucratic agencies, his cabinet. Okay, and then they have they get to vote on it. Uh, that is a really important power, particularly because. Although the framers probably didn't intend for the judicial branch to have much power, they, they do because they can uh, declare laws unconstitutional. In the House, uh, discussion must be germane. So germane here, uh, it's not like one of the Jackson 5. Germane means uh, it, per, it is about the legislation at hand, okay? Another special term here with the House is a discharge petition. So when you um, when you want to pass a bill, it goes to committee, which we'll talk about this process in a minute. And sometimes it could sit in committee forever. They basically table, which means to, to put aside the bill, and then they just don't want to talk about it. Well, let's say um, that you really want to vote on that bill. You're a member and it's really important to you. You can file a discharge petition to get it heard on the House floor. That happens very rarely. Something that's happened much more so on the Senate side is that um, it used to be you, but it used to be used quite a bit more, or at least the threat of it uh, was utilized, and that's the filibuster. So this is where senators can just talk at length about um, whatever they want to talk about. Again, it doesn't have to be germane to the topic uh, in order to basically stop a vote on a bill. So they can just talk about random things. They can get up and read the telephone uh, book or uh, they can read Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham. They can read, they can do whatever they want uh, unless the members can get a vote of cloture to shut down debate. And they have to have uh, 60 votes in order to shut down debate. So basically it used to be that any bill in the Senate uh, would have to have 60 votes in order to pass because if someone didn't like it, then they could just keep talking and talking and talking and kill the bill that way. Okay. So keep reading here. Um, I'm going to read Hugh's question and then and I may be able to, to answer it. Um, but if you'll keep reading this, let's see, hold on. 
I might have another question to put up. Actually, when I put the next question up, I'll respond to you, okay? All right. Um, so read this question here. Give me your best guess to it, and then we'll talk. So um, you both got C that members are elected by constituents in a local district based on population with the House uh, and with the Senate, they are elected uh, by constituents of an entire state. So good deal. All right. Uh, on D, they have it backwards, right? It should be two years over in the House and six years in the Senate. Uh, on the House side, it says invoking closure would delay the policymaking process. And that happens in the House and the Senate instead of the House. But it's not really invoking closure that delays it. it actually would speed it up if you invoked closure. Um, so that makes B incorrect. Okay, so good deal. Let's go to the next. Okay. So here I want to talk about um, some terms that get a lot of kids um, confused. The difference between reapportionment and redistricting. So the Constitution gives a certain amount of House district seats, but at a certain, it's like capped at 435. 
So what happens is as the population changes, say it moves from the rust belt to the sun belt, for example, um, because the population is moving, then that means that the places, the states that have gained population should gain seats and the places that lose population should lose seats. And so reapportionment is the reallocating of number of seats per state. And this happens every year after the census, every, not every year, every 10 years after the census. Um, redistricting, though, is how we redraw the lines after a census. And all, in almost all states, this is done by a political party that's in charge. Uh, in 2002, I was uh, an intern at my state of Tennessee's capital. And we were the first bill that was passed that year. The very first thing on the agenda was redistricting. And I have never seen anything so contentious. Like that was the biggest deal that happened that legislative term. Uh, in fact, I saw two uh, men in their 60s almost get into a fist fight about the way they were drawing lines uh, because it has a real impact on their electability in the next election, right? So redistricting isn't necessarily uh, doing it to promote one party over the other. That is a different term called gerrymandering. So it's when state legislatures redistrict to benefit one party over another. Um, cracking and packing is something that you could see on the AP exam, and it's just a method of gerrymandering. So um, if you're the party in charge, you could crack up all of the minority party votes. So I don't mean like minorities as far as racial minorities here. I mean like just if you're a Demo if the Democrats are in charge because they have a minority or excuse me, a majority, then they can uh, kind of crack up all the districts and put only a, a minority amount of Republicans in each district so that way they can never get a seat. Or another way that you can do it is you can pack them all, like every, all the people into one district uh, of a certain party. And so that way, you know, you're only giving up one seat and you're ensuring that all your other seats will go to your party, okay? So yeah, I, I saw a comment there Redistricting good, gerrymandering bad. Yeah, kind of, because like um, gerrymandering is doing it to help a particular party, and that kind of seems unfair, right? It also helps um, those people in power stay in power, and, and that's not probably a good idea for progress, right? Um, redistricting can be a good thing in that, you know, you should change the lines based on the population. If you never redraw your lines and the population changes, then that's going to unfairly represent some people uh, and have over represent others. Okay. Okay, so I'll get to an example of gerrymandering in uh, a second, and I'll answer Dakota's question in just a minute too, okay? All right, so do you see this um, map right here, okay? That is a very oddly shaped map. You know, that, that's not a map, a congressional district where everybody's kind of centrally located. They're kind of spread out all over everywhere, okay? And so that's probably not necessarily but probably gerrymandering because what you're doing is you're just redrawing everything to get the type of people that you want in that district so you might draw it to if you're a democrat and you're in charge of the state house you might uh, draw a district in a way to get 65 percent uh democrats and that's probably always going to win an election for you okay um so I want you to read these two questions and get an answer to them. And then I'll uh, respond to Dakota about majority minority districts.
So what do you guys think about um, number five and six? Okay, so um, we've got one response that either B or D for number five. Okay, so the map shows the outline of a congressional district, which the following statements best explains the motivation behind the way in which it's drawn. Okay, um, so yeah, D, it has likely been drawn to pack together voters who are registered with the same party. So to ensure that party success. Um, A, it's been drawn by a political party to group together moderate voters. Um, no, because that's not going to ensure one person or one group success. All right. Um, just in sake of time, let's go on to six because I haven't even covered the judicial branch and we only have 10 minutes left. Ah. Okay, so number six, uh, it will lead to less competitive general election, which could lead to increased partisanship. So yeah, good. A is correct for number six. Okay, so the structure of the Congress is that you have a leadership um, in both the House and Senate. We call the head honcho for the House, the Speaker of the House. Um, they also have some whips and floor leaders. The Senate has their top position as president pro tem, but that's largely ceremonial. And the person who really has power there in the Senate is the majority leader. The committee process allows for specializ specialization. And so that way, if you're, you're in Iowa, you can be on the agricultural committee because that's what's going to help your constituents the best, the most, because, you know, you're in the, the bread belt. Um, and so that helps you with reelection because you can say that you fought for your constituents in that way. There are standing committees. Um, in the House, your major standing committees are the Judiciary Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, and the Rules Committee. And the Senate, uh, the Judiciary Committee is also very important because it approves all of the, or it's the first to approve the president's uh, judicial appointments. The Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee is important there in the Senate. There are many uh, subcommittees and also select committees. And then another important committee that you have to know for the AP exam is the conference committee. The conference committee reconciles the House and Senate versions of bills. So with the next one, I'll show you, it's kind of a convoluted process of how a bill becomes a law. Uh, hopefully you've seen the Schoolhouse Rock video on this. Um, but first it can start in one house, all right? Then usually a very similar version is on the other half. It is introduced in the other house. So if you see that you're introducing it here, uh, but then you're also introducing it again in the other house. It's debated, it's amended, uh, but then it's going to have to go back. Uh, if the versions are not exactly the same, they'll have a conference committee, which is shown here in the middle. And then it actually has to go back to be voted on. Then it has to be um, signed by the president. If, of course, if the president vetoes it, then the House and Senate can override the veto, but they have to have two thirds support to do that. OK. Um, so I said this, but it's been a few minutes. If it's been in committee for a long time and it's unlikely to make it to the floor, what could a House member do in order to get a vote on the bill? What do you think for number seven? So A is a good guess in that that closes a vote, in, but that is in the Senate, okay? And so this is for the House. And so the House, yeah, good, 
can file a discharge petition to get it heard. Okay. So how legislators make decisions is they have to think about their audience and their audience uh, is, are their constituents, their, the interest groups that are relevant to whatever bill there are, they're um, debating and also their party. Log rolling and pork barrel spending are two important terms here too. And this is how um, the sausage gets made, which is just a, a, a euphemism or a term with the associated with the legislative process because it's not really pretty how um, how bills become laws because sometimes some shady things go, go on. So log rolling is, okay, you vote for my bill and I'll vote for your bill. And the reason why that's kind of shady is because it might not be in the best interest for your constituents for you to, to vote for that other bill, but you do so in order to get something good for your um, constituents passed. Pork barrel spending is when you attach uh, spending projects onto to bills that will help your district. For example, here in the picture, um, there was something called a, the Bridge to Nowhere, which Sarah Palin brought up uh, when she was running for vice president with John McCain uh, several years ago. Uh, she brought it up because it was a, a pet project in Alaska that really was seen as wasteful government spending. And it was attached uh, to a funding bill. Uh, and she thought it was unnecessary spending. And, and that does happen. And the reason why that happens is it, it gets people on board to vote for things if they get promised uh, money for their district. So there's three models on how uh, legislators kind of conduct themselves. The first is the trustee model. Um, and that is that the public trust the legislator to vote with um, like their ideas about what is best for their district. So they entrust their legislator to make good decisions. Okay. The delegate model is basically that you only do what your uh, constituents want. So you're heavily going to poll your constituents and talk to them uh, to figure out what they want you to do. And the Politico model is that you kind of do a little bit of both. Um, you act how you want to act when you know that your, your constituents really aren't paying attention or if the majority don't care, then you kind of vote how you the way that you think would be best for your district. But on like high profile votes, you vote as your constituents would want you and how they have expressed that they want you to vote. Um, so politic as someone who's a Politico, you know, they're someone who is kind of politically savvy in that way. What do you think? Um, legislatures, how, how should legislature legislators make decisions. Thanks, you. All right. Um, and so I'll have this one last question. And we just won't get to the judicial branch today. Sorry, maybe I'll do that. Um, I'll be doing another live chat on uh, the three branches of government. So I'll do more judicial stuff then. So let's close out with this question. If I got Dakota still around. So, Senator Smith votes her conscience on bills that her constituents care little about. So she votes how she wants when the constituents don't know about it. But then um, she votes according to the wishes of the majority on other bills. What type of re representation do her actions embody? Politico model, trustee model, majoritarian model, or delegate model? What do you think? So the, so the majoritarian model is basically the same thing as the delegate model, but that is not the right answer because that would be that she did that 
all of the time. She always votes based on the wishes of her constituents. Because sometimes she votes her conscience, um, then she is representing the Politico model or A. B, the trustee model, would be that she always votes how she wants to. And she doesn't really listen to her constituents, not because she doesn't uh, like her constituents or want to be reelected, but she just feels her role is that uh, she was entrusted to do a job and she she's going to read into uh, all of the information and, and form a judgment based on uh, her research. OK, so the political model is that you do a little bit of both. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I really appreciate your participation. Uh, it, it's really helped me uh, teach you better, I think. And if you liked it, I will be back in a week or two. Uh, thank you so much, Dakota. And you can um, add us on social media at Think Fiveable. And I also have a Twitter account that I just started. So I don't have too many followers yet. So don't at me or I don't know, I think I'm lame. I'm building it up. So I'd appreciate uh, you following me at LAP for AP. Thank you so much. Bye.